Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Attorney Jav Vlogger, Law for the Everyday Layman. Today we continue with our series on corporations and we'll be talking about the board of directors and corporate officers. So if you like my videos and you want to see more, please hit the subscribe button. Also, please remember that this is only for educational purposes and is not a substitute for proper legal advice or for studying and understanding the law. Okay? A like on this video or any of my other videos would also be greatly appreciated. Now, I will be dividing the topic of uh, Board of Directors and Corporate Officers into uh, parts, no? So, uh, given the length of the discussion, okay? So, uh, let's begin with the nature of the Board of Directors, okay? So, we've already talked about the definition, nature, and attributes of a corporation, and remember that a corporation is an artificial being and therefore it cannot perform any physical act by itself. No? So how does a corporation act? It acts through its duly elected board of directors and its duly authorized officers. Okay. So following section 22 as a general rule, the board of directors or the board no? for uh, the sake of expediency, the board is the repository of all corporate powers. When the law says that unless pro otherwise provided in this code, the board shall exercise the corporate powers, conduct all business, and control all properties of the corporation. Okay? That's the general rule. Now, the exceptions would be in the case of a duly authorized officer okay, who can bind the corporation through his act. Or another exception would be the executive committee, a management contract, or in the case of closed corporations, where the stockholders may directly manage the business if authorized by the Articles of Incorporation. But we'll talk about those later. No? And the closed corporations, I'll give a whole di different episode for that. Okay? Just remember the general rule that the board of directors shall exercise the corporate powers, conduct all business, and control all properties of the corporation. In the absence of authority or valid delegation from the board, no person, not even the officers, can validly bind the corporation. Okay? So that delegation of powers comes in the form of a board resolution. Okay? So the board is the governing body of the corporation chosen or elected by the stockholders to oversee the management and the operation of the corporation. The board has the sole authority to determine company policy and conduct ordinary business of the corporation within the scope of its charter in all matters which do not require the consent or approval of the stockholders. Later on, you will uh, learn that uh, certain corporate powers can only be exercised uh, through the board with the concurrence of the stockholders. But unless, uh, but if it does not, uh, it is not required under the law, then the board can just act on behalf of the corporation. Okay. The nature of the power of the board is such that under the theory of original power, the powers of the board are original and undelegated in the sense that the stockholders uh, do not confer the power on the board and they do not the, and the stockholders do not revoke those powers, no? The powers of the board come from the articles and the bylaws, no? Which in turn is a grant from the state. Okay? However, the powers of the board are also derivative Okay, that's what I was saying, no? in the sense of being received from the state through the act of incorporation. Okay? Now, the concentration of power in the board is deemed necessary for the sake of efficiency, okay? especially in a large organization because it's impractical and unwise to entrust the administration of corporate affairs to a host of scattered stockholders no? who are generally unfamiliar with the business of the corporation. So they are unable to comprehend corporate management. No? So instead of many people act, trying to act on behalf of the corporation, it's the power to bind the corporation is lodged in the board. Okay? Now, while the managerial authority of the board is generally broad, no, it is subject to at least three limitations. First, it must observe the limitations or restrictions imposed by the law like the Constitution and the Revised Corporation Code as well as the Articles of Incorporation. 
Second, the board cannot perform constituent acts or acts involving fundamental or major changes in the corporation, like amending the Articles of Incorporation. And third, the board cannot exercise powers which are not possessed by the corporation. Now, by virtue of the power the board possesses, the directors necessarily hold a fiduciary relation or a position involving trust and confidence. The, they have a fiduciary relation to the corporations and the stockholders whom they represent. The consequence of this fiduciary relation is that they are required to discharge their duties in good faith and with diligence, care, and skill. Okay? And they may be held liable if they breach this fiduciary duty. Okay? Take note, however, that while directors have a fiduciary fiduciary duty to the corporation, they do not stand in a fiduciary relation to any single stockholder. However, take note of the special fact doctrine, no? which says that while a director does not stand in a fiduciary relation to the stockholder, he is under legal obligation to make a fair and full disclosure of pertinent official information where special circumstances exist, giving rise to the obligation to disclose. Okay. Now, how does the board itself act in such a way that it can bind the corporation? So, the board must act together as a body, no? in a lawful meeting, not individually or separately. Okay? So, uh, unlike officers who are uh, duly authorized to act on behalf of the corporation by the board, the board are not the agents of the corporation individually. Huh? They have to act together. So, they have no power to bind the corp by their individual acts. Unless, of course, they are authorized by a board resolution. No? Okay? So, uh, the, board, the members of the board, the directors, they must vote at a meeting. And these meetings may be regular meetings, which uh, under the law must be held monthly unless otherwise stated in the bylaws. The bylaws can provide for the date or frequency of the regular meetings. Or they may also have special meetings, okay? And special meetings may be held anytime, okay? On call of the president or as provided in the bylaws, okay? The president can call for a special meeting. Now, these meetings, whether regular or special, can be held anywhere within or even outside of the Philippines except as stated by the bylaws. Now, if the bylaws say only in a certain place, then the meeting should be held there, okay? Now, these meetings are presided over by the chairman, okay? Or in the absence of the chairman, then the president. And of course, notice of the meeting must be sent to every director at least two days before the meeting unless a longer time is provided in the bylaws. Take note, however, that the directors may waive the notice requirement, okay? And if a director cannot physically attend or vote at a meeting, he can participate and vote through remote communication like video conferencing, teleconferencing, etc. But they cannot vote by proxy. Okay? They cannot select a proxy to vote for them. Okay? We'll talk about proxies in another episode. Okay? So when the board of uh, directors meets and they, uh, they come out with a resolution to perform an act, this will be binding on the corporation. And under the business judgment rule, courts you know, courts no, cannot uh, undertake to control the discretion of the board about administrative matters as to which they have the legitimate power of action. Okay? As to, uh, when it comes to contracts intra vires, no, intra meaning uh, acts within the power of the corporation no, entered into by the board, those are binding on the corporation and courts will not interfere unless contracts are so unconscionable and oppressive as to amount to a wanton destruction of the rights of the minority. Okay? In other words, questions of policy or management are left to the honest decision of directors or officers, no? and the courts are without authority to substitute its judgment for that of the board. Okay? 
the board is the business manager of the corporation and so long as the board acts in good faith, then its uh, decisions are not reviewable by the courts. Okay? As a consequence, resolutions and transactions entered into by the board within the powers of the corporation cannot be reversed by the courts, ha? Huh? Not even at the request of the stockholders and directors and officers acting within such business judgment cannot be held personally liable for such acts. We'll talk about the liability of directors later, okay? So again, how does the board act? It meets and it votes. And under section 52, Every decision reached by at least a majority of uh, the directors or trustees in case of non-stock corporation no? constituting a quorum, okay? quorum shall be valid as a corporate act except for the election of officers which shall require the vote of a majority of all the members of the board. So general rule, normal corporate act, majority of a quorum. But um, election of officers, that requires majority of all the members of the board. And what is a quorum? A quorum is simply the number of persons who must be present in order to take action. So uh, how do we compute the quorum? Generally, it's just majority. 50% plus 1, no? So uh, out of uh, 10, generally, 6 people will uh, constitute a quorum, no? So, uh, a majority of directors shall constitute a quorum to transact corporate business, but the Articles of Incorporation or the bylaws may provide for a greater majority than the normal quorum. Okay? Now, the quorum requirement will still be the same even if there is a vacancy or if one of the directors turns out to never have been qualified. So, if the number of directors in the Articles is uh, 5, no? The majority in the absence of a greater majority stated in the bylaws would be three. So at least three directors have to be present in the meeting to vote on a corporate act and bind the corporation. But let's say out of the five, no, one of those was never qualified because he never owned the share of stock and two of the directors died. Okay, Now there will only be two directors left. Can they vote on a corporate act like filling up vacancies so as to bind the corporation? No, because they do not constitute a quorum. Remember, the quorum is three and there are only two left. So they do not constitute a quorum. The vacancy should now be filled up according to the law. And we'll talk about that uh, later on. No, We'll talk about filling up vacancies. Okay, Just take note that if they do not constitute a quorum, then the they cannot act. Uh, subject, of course, to exceptions, which I'll discuss later on. Now, as I said earlier, there are exceptions to the rule that the board exercises all the powers of the corporation, and the power to bind the corporation rests in the board. Now, this power may be delegated either expressly or impliedly to other officers or agents of the corporation. The power may also be delegated to an executive committee. Under Section 34, if the bylaws so provide, the board may create an executive committee composed of at least three directors. The executive committee may act by majority vote of all its members on such specific matters within the competence of the board which were delegated to it by the bylaws or by majority vote of the board. However, the law expressly says that they cannot vote on the following matters. They cannot vote on approval of any action for which stockholder approval is also required. They cannot vote on filling of vacancies in the board. They cannot vote on amendment, repeal, adoption of new bylaws. They cannot vote on amendment or repeal of any resolution of the board which by its express terms is not amendable or repealable. And they cannot vote on distribution of cash dividends to the stockholders. No, that's codal, ha? That's codal. So you can just uh, check up on that later on, no? Uh, but those are the matters which the execom or the executive committee cannot vote upon. Now, the execom, no, executive committee, has all the authority of the board to the extent granted by the board resolution or the bylaws. Okay? The spring cannot rise higher than its source. Okay? So they can only exercise whatever is granted to them. Okay? And the decisions of the executive committee are not subject to appeal. 
to the board. Huh? So their uh, decisions are binding as long as they act within the scope of their powers. Okay? But, <coughs> but if the executive committee performs an act which it is not authorized to do, then the board may choose to ratify it. Okay? But uh, of course, if it is not, then if, if the board does not ratify it, then that act is, is not valid. So the purpose of the executive committee is to expedite action on important matters without the need for a board meeting, especially when such meeting cannot be readily held. No? So the execom directly manages the operations of the corporation between meetings of the board. Okay? They reduce the workload of the board. The execom is just as powerful as the board. Okay, and it actually performs certain duties of the board and in effect is acting for the board itself. Of course, again, it has to act within the scope of its powers. Take note also that the board may also create other special committees of temporary or even permanent nature and they may, they may determine the member's term, composition, compensation, powers, and responsibilities. Okay? Now, another instance when, they, when the board may delegate powers is in, is in the case of a management contract where a corporation undertakes to manage or operate all or substantially all of the business of another corporation and uh, shall not be that uh, management contract according to the law should not be longer than five years for any one term, okay? And uh, we'll talk about that more when we talk about the powers of a corporation. Now, just take note that uh, the board may delegate its powers in case of a management contract, which shall not be longer than five years for any one term. So, as you can see, the board can delegate powers, but there are limits. Discretionary powers or those which allow the... Discretionary powers meaning those which allow the actor to, de to decide the course of action no the, the, these discretionary powers are vested exclusively in the board by the law the articles or the bylaws or the stockholders okay uh, but if it is not a discretionary power like such as the election of officers that power cannot be delegated no so again discretionary powers or those which uh, allow the actor to decide no a specific course of action Okay, they can uh, be exercised by the board, but if it's not a discretionary action, it uh, falls within the realm of uh, uh, the stockholder. You follow the law, no? Ministerial duties, no? If it's not discretionary, it's a ministerial duties. Ministerial duties may be delegated. Discretionary uh, powers cannot, okay? The board cannot also delegate entire supervision and control of the corporation ha? okay it cannot delegate special powers given to it by the stockholders and any power of the board to delegate will of course be subject to any restrictions as provided in the bylaws okay so uh, that's it for uh, the nature of the board of directors no and uh, i'll uh, reserve the next part for discussion of qualifications, disqualifications, and election of directors, okay? As well as uh, term and holdover. Okay, so uh, that's it for uh, this part of the episode, and I hope to see you soon, guys. Bye!